Aloha, and welcome to Condo Insider, Hawaii's weekly show about living in an association, mostly condominiums, but we've been doing this show about three or four years now and uh, produced a couple of hundred uh, episodes that are available through Think Tech Hawaii on YouTube from all sorts of issues on uh, managing an association and it's designed primarily for board members and homeowners. And uh, it's been very, very successful and very popular as a part of our industry educational effort to teach people about what it's like to be in an association and how the world is changing. I do want to start before I introduce our guest, telling everybody that a big ruling came out from FHA this week where they've advised all the lenders for these Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac mortgages that they're changing their qualification rules if you want to qualify for one of those mortgages. And it's all centered around the Champlain Tower South collapse in Surfside, Florida. There's all sorts of new restrictions and requirements on reserve studies and disclosures and the status of a condominium that could have a dire effect on getting a mortgage for some people if the association is not well maintained. We'll cover this in another show in the future, but know that the collapse of uh, uh, Champlain Tower South, dominantly called Surfside, is having a ripple effect uh, in the mortgage industry already. But today's show, it's my honor and privilege to have one of our state representatives in the house Matt Lepresti here with us today. He and I were talking earlier about uh, uh, condominiums and, uh, and uh, he's been very interested in that topic for many years about where the world is going and why it's going that way, what we need to make it better for everybody. So first of all, let me uh, introduce Matt. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Richard. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, one thing I always like our guests to do is become kind of um, introduce themselves to people who are watching this show because we see legislators and it's always about the legislative effort. Tell us about you, your family, how long you've been in Hawaii. And I know you have a PhD, I think. So yes, uh, that's a, yes. is a, is a congratulations. That's a hard accomplishment. Thanks. Um, yeah, I do have a PhD in philosophy. My, my vocation is as a professor, I teach philosophy and ethics um, and some world religions, humanities, political science. Um, at Hawaii Pacific University. I did my PhD here at UH in Manoa. Uh, I finished in 2008. I came out here to, to go to grad school from Ohio and I moved out here in 1999. So I've lived in Hawaii now for about 22 years and um, married a local girl and we had kids They're in public school. We got two little kids um, in junior high and then in elementary school. Um, but uh. Yeah, I mean, I, I got into politics because I started paying attention to what was going on around me when we were when we bought our first home. Um, as a homeowner, I got on our board and our association, which I serve as a president now, and I started to become much more familiar with opportunities for improvement in our society. And I thought I would um, be able to help with that, so I put my hat in the ring to help with that. You know. Having a PhD, you know, ironically, by the way, I've, I've, I've been a guest lecturer for over 10 years at Hawaii Pacific University in their master's program in business. Uh, I primarily lecture on a course called Policy Formation for Managers, hmm. which basically says the policies you set may have a greater effect on your success than you think, you know, yeah. if you make uh, too many hard policies. But it's got to be a, a challenge to run for office when you've never done it before. What were the obstacles you found? Man, it was really hard. It was the hardest thing I ever did in my life, actually, uh, was winning. I, I ran in 2012 and I lost. Um, and I ran, frankly, after meeting my legislator, I was very unimpressed. <laughs> I thought, I'm going to help somebody beat you and nobody would run against her. So I did. And I get my, well, I lost in a big way by 40 points. So as an academic, I took a class. And I thought anything worth doing once is worth doing twice if you really care about it. And um, they, co they call it political science for a reason. There's a real science to this. And I learned about marketing, fundraising, uh, communications, um, how to talk to voters about what they care about and how to listen to voters uh, to understand what they need. So I 
did all that. And then I, I walked the district, I think three and a half times. And um, I had a 40 point swing and I won in 2014. So this is my third uh, term in office now. Um, I was out for a couple of years last time when I ran for the Senate, but decided to come back to the House. But it, the, the, one of the big problems I see in, uh, frankly, in our democracy is that the skills needed to win an election often have nothing to do with doing the job well. And that's frustrating to see um, because you get some people in who are really good at running campaigns and really good at getting you to like them and vote for them. But then they get in and it's like the dog who caught the car and, and policy is a whole another world. Well, let me, first of all, thank you for uh, serving in our legislature. I've said many times, this is a thankless position. And the problem with legislators in general is you get elected and, it, and you may have skills in certain areas, but the legislature is so broad and all, all the type of bills and issues that come forward, you have to, in a short amount of time, become an expert on the issues and the two sides and maybe three or four sides that have different points of view on that. So first of all, let me thank you for uh, agreeing to do that. I don't think it's a, a, you know, I would tell you this true story quickly that uh, a good friend of mine was Mark Takai, if you knew Mark Takai, yeah, who knew Mark. was a congressman and, and uh, passed away. He was a very good friend of me. And he and another representative of the state legislature went to dinner with me and asked me if I'd ever consider running for office. And I'll never forget my words to them. My exact words were, didn't I tell you I was running? And they looked with big eyes at me and I said, I'm running as far away from that as you could ever get because I'd make a lousy politician, you know? So it takes a special person like you to be able to do it. And, and we appreciate it, even though I'm sure there's times you and I won't agree or others won't agree, but if we're all fighting for a better Hawaii, so be it, you know, and that's, that's, right. and that's how it goes. So yeah. how do you compare that with being on a condo board? Politics is politics, you know, it's just a different level. Um, the, the good thing about the condo board is because we're all neighbors, or at least most everybody is neighbors. Sometimes you have landowners who are on the board and don't live in the area, but um, there's a much more friendliness and courteousness and everybody has shared interest that if um, you make a bad decision, it affects your home. And that's um, something that is more intimate than, than regular politics, I'd say. But nevertheless, there's a, there's elements of political shenanigans sometimes that's, you know, you, you're never going to avoid in any kind of power structure. I think with condo, it's a business in a way. Mm -hmm. You're going to have different people. I'm convinced a lot of people are buying condos and don't know they have to follow rules. You yeah. Know, you know, and they decide that they don't have to follow the rules because this is America and we don't have to follow <laughs> the rules, you know, so. I've seen everything. I've been in this business since 1992. And I think I've seen about everything. I spend a lot of time now as an expert witness and teaching on condo matters, but it, it too is a thankless job in a way. Oh yeah. It's, it's more thankless than, than uh, the legislature, at least in the legislature, we get a paycheck. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, it's interesting you say, you see them as a business. I see them as small governments. So some of the areas in Hawaii, like Mililani, for example, and Neville Beach, where I represent, um, much of the homes are HOAs and an HOA, not just a condo, but a larger homeowner association. And they have the power of, of small governments. So like Evo Beach has the size, what, 70,000 people. And that's the size of a large town on the mainland where you would have a mayor and a police force and all these sorts of things. But we don't have that. We have condo boards. And they tell you what to do with your yard and how to do it and what's got to be done when. And there's basic rules and regulations for maintaining cleanliness and, and a, a nice place to live. Uh, so I see them in really a small government. It's taxation, right? I mean, they have fees. So it was good. Well, there's, there's a lot of yeah. truth to that. You know, they are kind of a, uh, they don't have uh, all power because they have to follow federal and state laws and things like that, but yeah. they certainly have the ability. And uh, I teach a class on parliamentary procedure, and I say the biggest mistake condo boards make is that your documents define what your authority is, and mm -hmm. so they make decisions that are outside their authority. And that's where most of the what I call the litigation and the problems begin. That they 
they think they can do more than what's empowered within their governing documents that they, uh, so, but that's just a personal feeling that I'm sharing with you. So anyway, talking about the state real quick before we uh, uh, take a break in a few minutes uh, and talk about the condo side. Mm -hmm. What do you see the major challenges for Hawaii this year? On the condo side with legislation? No, in, uh, on the state, uh, the state oh, as a whole. Just in general. Oh, well, obviously COVID and the economy and reopening. Um, I think they just announced that they're still going to require the three foot rule, which I don't know that. I'm, I mean, I'm, I've got my vaccines and my booster and everything, and I support all that. But um, there are other places that seem to be opening safely, faster. And I think we need to be moving in that direction, too. Um, they just started letting bars and restaurants, I think, stay open later. But they're still at, at, at limited capacity. And uh, it's not easy running a restaurant. It's not easy running a bar. And um, it's, it's a lot of people's livelihoods at stake. And I think the sooner we can open that up, the better, because the vaccination numbers are really getting up there. And that's encouraging. Uh, so well, that's I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you 100. percent We've got to get open, and there's there's risks in living, and uh, I'm not going to get into that in great detail. But we've got to get open because people are dying because they can't make a living, you know, and that's got to be open. But the thing that has bothered me a little bit, from what I've heard the legislature later, various people, not you, um, is that you know since I've lived here in 1974. We've always known that tourism is the cornerstone to our economy, mm -hmm. followed by the military. And we now have all this push, we wanna to limit tourism, but then you wanna expand the economy to pay for more entitlements and programs, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see tourism in this? Where, where are you on that subject, you know? Yeah, uh, there's been a, it's been an ongoing, I don't know if we'd even call it a debate, but for decades, people have been talking about limiting tourism as it's grown and grown and grown. But what does make sense to me is identifying some degree of carrying capacity and how much we can reasonably expect to accommodate and at what cost, right? Because there's an environmental cost, there's an infrastructure cost. And one of the ways that, that people have talked about doing this is by trying to attract higher paying tourists. So that way, if you can get more bang for your buck, from the tourist industry with less impact on the environment, on traffic, on infrastructure, then that might be an ideal thing to do. Um, I think that's the right way to go, but at the same time, I don't wanna see Hawaii become a classist resort state just for the, the uber wealthy. Um, you know, it's, it's a family brand that they have here. And I think they need to maintain that, not just for the rich, um, but that's a really complicated it's a really complicated question, especially when you start to think about sea level rise. Waikiki was a swamp, and it'll be a swamp again uh, with sea level rise. So wh what's going to happen to those hotels? Um, they're building so many new sky rises in Kaka'ako. That place is flooded during king tides already. And so some of the most, some of the, the fastest development area is, is going to be underwater in 30 years. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And, and, and I don't understand how we're planning. It seems like we're not planning at all for development, for affordable housing, for the tourism industry, for the future. Um, people are just scrambling right now to try to deal with, with the fires that we already have to put out. Um, so I, it's, it's, it keeps me up at night sometimes worrying about these things. Are they going to have to build a seawall? Are they going to move all the hotels out to the west side of the island? I mean, uh, how is that going to work? I think you're right on. Yeah, I think you're right on. I, I don't see any plan. I mean, I've heard uh, we need to find some something to replace tourism. I've heard that for 46 years. And yeah. uh, we have to face the fact that we're an island that attracts people because of our beauty and not just the uh, beauty of the surf and the mountains, but we have a cultural beauty here. It's beyond anything I've ever experienced. I, I, I love the culture here. I know it's a county issue, but you do you have any short, fast take on, vac on the vacation rental, short-term vacation rental feelings? Well, yeah, I think that's a, been a real problem. And um, I'm, certain, I'm certainly in favor of, of limiting and regulating them. The county, Honolulu County has done a really poor job of regulating that industry. 
whereas other counties, I think, have done a better job. Uh, one of the things that we did last year was um, in the legislature was we passed a new tax structure that enables the counties to um, use to raise their own TAT. And really what that's going to help do, I, I imagine, is help incentivize the counties to go after these the illegal vacation rentals. And um, that's a good thing because A, they're skipping on their taxes, and B, we need to make sure that homes here are for people who live here. Uh, it's, one of the, it's one of the driving costs, not the only. There's lots of driving costs, so um, uh, pressures of, of rising the cost of housing, but that is, that is one of them as illegal vacation rentals. You know, I, I support you know, that vacation rentals should be regulated and should be legal. I don't think they should be everywhere in every community, but yeah. I still think there is a market for a certain level of vacation rentals. And I would tell you, I happen to have a apartment I own in Waikiki that I use for over 30 day rentals. Mm. And of course they're talking about 180 day rentals as a, as a in this new bill before the county uh, mm. city council. And so I looked at my tenants and uh, tenant number one was a family who's opening a business in Hawaii. They're building a restaurant. And while they look for a home, they wanted to rent my place for three or four months, less than 180 days. Mm -hmm. Then my next tenant was two, they called themselves handyman, but they were nuclear engineers working on a submarine in Pearl Harbor, maintaining the submarine, but they weren't military. They were Department of Defense, right? So uh, they were here for like 75 days. And the third one was a doctor, but the doctor wasn't at a hospital. They had a contract with the University of Hawaii as far as the sports medicine program. And mm -hmm. then I had a speech therapist who was helping the varsity school with young children. And they were all here typically 60 to 120 days, all less than 180. Yeah. And, 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 and the, the city council bill would, would put that out of business unless they clean up the language, you know. Huh. But there's a market for those kinds of transit rentals that is necessary to have a vibrant Hawaii economy, in my opinion. So yeah, anyway. it sounds like it. No, I, I, I'm not familiar with the bill before the council right now, but that's yeah. Well, yeah, we got it off the track, but but we okay. want to get to know you and get your take on a lot of things. But on that note, we're going to take a one minute break, and we're going to be back with Matt Lepresti in a second to talk about condos specifically. So we, we'll be right back in one minute. Aloha, my name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. My program comes on every other Monday, one o'clock, and we talk about a lot of different subjects, all of them law related in some way, either life or practice. And I try to have a diversity of guests that can talk about different topics of interest. So please join us, Think Tech Hawaii, Law Across the Sea program, every other Monday, one o'clock in the afternoon. Aloha. Aloha, Richard Emery back again with Representative Matt Lepresti talking about our state, our economy, and about condo living. Matt's uh, a board president of his condo and uh, before I ask you a couple of questions about some of your objectives this year, what's your take about the condo industry in general and being on a board and the industry? And there's a lot of, you know, to me, a lot of language out there certain around, it may not be totally accurate, not from you, but in general. So what's, what's your take about the condo industry? Well, you guys uh, get a bad rap, just like politicians sometimes, uh, the management agencies. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a strange world. Um, sometimes it's, uh, I think the proper word is it's incestuous with developers. Sometimes people switch jobs between managing associations and developers and um, you never know who's, uh, I think a common feeling for condo owners and HOA members is sometimes you feel like 
the HOA and the condo board's not on your side. Um, and that's unfortunate because the more people were, if more people got involved, then they would be part of the decision-making process and help understand why decisions are made that otherwise feel like they're being imposed upon you. And then it gets people upset and they, they don't, they don't understand why, why the things happen, but that's because they're not involved. And so, um, you know, my take on the board on, on boards in general is that the more people who get involved, the better, uh, they help make their community better. Um, but there's a, I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, and that's what I'm going to be looking at in some bills coming up. So let's talk about some of those bills. Which one do you want to talk about first? You well, I first, several yeah. Discuss. So I pick, pick one one of, to talk about. the one thing that I hear a lot of complaints about in my district in Eva Beach is people buy into a new development or, or a new, or sorry, they buy a, a home in a development that already existed and they have HOA rules. And they live in there for a couple of years and then they get a letter in the mail from the HOA saying, hey, this change was made by the previous owners and you need to fix it. And then they get a fine or they get in some dispute and it's really frustrating. So one of the bills I wanna look at is trying to limit kind of like a statute of limitations on when an HOA or a condo board can issue fines. So if they don't, if they don't fix things, if they don't get things identified before a condo switches property or within some reasonable time frame, then they can't go after the new owners. Um, because what happens is depending on the um, depending on the board and how with it they are, sometimes you'll have boards who neglect that stuff. And then uh, you get a new activist board a few years later, and now they want to go after everybody and, and bring the, everybody to heal. And it's, it's, it's got to be consistent. And there's got to be a timeline and expectations, reasonable expectations for homeowners, uh, new homeowners, to uh, not be held to be responsible for faults that were made before them and that the HOA should have caught then, not now. So that's one thing. Um, I'm not Let sure. Let me just comment on that yeah. real quick. Sure, please do. Because uh, I think as an industry, we support that, provided that you take a condo like a high rise, if someone did something inside the unit that no one could see, and it affected the structural integrity of the building, there's gotta be some carve outs to protect the building and the safety and the association as well. Um, more of these things come from exterior appearance changes from my experience, mm. you know, and I, I agree with you that, that uh, there ought to be a point in time that if you haven't done something, it's grandfathered. I mean, I'm actually an expert in a case right now that the exterior changes to the apartment in a condo were made 40 years ago. And the new board has decided well, they weren't made correctly, so we want you to tear your apartment about it. That's ridiculous. Which is totally ridiculous. It's, yeah. it's, it's obscene. Yeah, but you're totally right about, you know, if there's, if there's load-bearing walls that somebody's messed with in a condo and a structure, yeah, that's not okay. It doesn't matter what the time limit on that is. It's got to be fixed for safety. So, but yeah, that's the one that I think might have the best impact on quality of life for people. Um, another... Um, is reserve estimates. So uh, I've spoken with you and, and some other people in the industry about um, trying to get more accurate reserve estimates. So for new developments, for example, um, they're required to, developers are required to give um, estimates on what it's gonna cost to do the maintenance fees. And universally, and I've never heard of a case where this is not true, that after the developer then turns over the board to the people, the prices jump up because, oh my gosh, uh, the numbers were too low and we were never collecting the right amount of money to begin with. They always, they always jump up. And you know, whether it's by design or not, almost doesn't matter. What it does is it, 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 it hurts the consumer uh, it hurts the homeowner who thinks that they can afford one thing at one level. And then it turns out that that's not entirely accurate. And so finding a way to require maybe independent reserve studies, independent um, third party studies that show what it's really gonna cost say to live in this condo. Um, that's something that I think needs to be done. Uh, and I agree with you. Yeah. 
you know, as I told you, I do a lot of expert work and I uh, have a reserve specialist designation, the highest reserve study preparation. And developers, for example, could do a level four reserve study by independent, which has some teeth to it. But the current law in Hawaii doesn't require the developer to do a reserve study. They leave it to the board and they give an estimate in their public report and allegedly, well, I shouldn't say allegedly, the law says it's supposed to be an accurate estimate, but they basically use averages or some number without any teeth to it. Yeah. And I'm looking at, I can't tell you countless people I've talked to in some of this litigation that are affordable housing buyers that now have to get second and third jobs has devastated their family income mm -hmm. because the numbers were so, so wrong. Yeah, yeah, and that, that genuinely hurts people. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's morally wrong. So it needs to be fixed. And I know you and some people are working on um, possibly a bill yeah. to that effect. And I, yeah. I hope I can work either on a well, Believe it or not, we're down, we're, we're down to two minutes. This code goes, oh my quick. gosh. Yeah. Uh, so what, what are your last thoughts about condo and condo legislation for the, for, for this year? I want to see people get involved so that they feel empowered and heard. Because a lot of times, and I'm hosting a town hall meeting next Tuesday, a virtual town hall meeting uh, on HOAs, because I think people get really frustrated when they don't understand the laws and what the rules are and what their rights are. And I, I want to develop a greater conversation with condo owners and boards and HOA residents to feel empowered because it's their boards. And they need to feel like they are, they need to get involved and they need to understand how they can make it better. And I hope to listen to them and find out ways that I can help. Well, you can be assured that uh, our industry will work with you to have meaningful legislation in the areas you've talked about. I know we didn't get a chance to talk about a couple other ones, but the reality, those are the two primary ones I know we talked about. But the industry really wants a balance. You have to respect the need for safety and, and rules for an association, but it can't be oppressive. You know, yeah. people have rights yeah. and it's gotta be a balance. So we look forward to this year working with you on proposed legislation. And I know you're attending the national seminar on a reserve public policy that has just been adopted by Community Association Institute nationally. I yeah. was on the task force for that, by the way. And uh, so we look forward to working with you this year and a successful year for you in the legislature and encourage all of you watching. If you want to go to the town hall, how would they do it? Contact Josh or your office? Uh, yeah, you can contact, go to, go to my website at the Capitol, uh, the Capitol website. Uh, that's hawaii.capital.gov. And uh, you can find my website there and there'll be a link to the meeting. If you're a resident in Eva Beach in my district, you'll be getting a newsletter today or tomorrow that has a link as well. Um, and if they want, they can just call me at 586-6080 and my staff will give them the information. Well, thank you very much for being on the show today and thank you for your service at the legislature. I know it's a tough job and your insight and what you see for 2022 for condos. And we thank you for being here and to all of of our viewers uh thank you for watching condo insider we'll be back again as we are every thursday at three o'clock at another show so again aloha and th thank you for viewing